I've finally entered the 21st century, JT, even though for uh-huh. like Scandinavian countries, this has existed for over like 150 years. And those are nicotine pouches, or as you brand obsessed fucking American monkeys like to call it Zins, right? You don't eat burgers, you eat McDonald's. <laughs> you don't take nicotine pouches, you take Zins. They don't have Zins here. The one I'm looking at is called Super White Daytona. So I guess it's only for white boys, the super whitest. Oh uh, four out of five strength. And the thing that that introduced to me is uh, my whole life I thought, yo, you're not addicted to nicotine. You just really like the smoke. You like how it tickles your throat. Uh-huh. You like uh, the social aspect of it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I was always like, I am above above addiction. Yeah. The second I started taking these, which are you probably don't know because you're what from born in the <laughs> 1800s i mean i'm super uh, vanilla yeah yeah you, you just take it you put it next to your gums like deep inside of your mouth it probably damages and is it is it loose tobacco me. no that's what changed it i guess you don't have okay. to spit all the time okay let's put a nice little pack and it can be flavored for ah. for all you beautiful little gbt people out there but <laughs> um it's really good and again what it taught me is that I am highly addicted to nicotine oh. because after I take a pouch of this, I just don't want to smoke. Like even seeing a cigarette eh, or seeing a vape go. right in front of me, I absolutely have 0% desire to light it up. And it's very strange and it's leading me to an extent to like a midlife crisis mm-hmm. because it's furthering the very real truth that we, you know, are just like uh, a bunch of uh, chemical compounds jiggling around, (laughs) which drive us to do thing A, thing B, thing C, that are only limited by, oh, Marxist, by the material conditions in which we find ourselves in. But but when it comes to, you know, the chemical compound of the human body, and it's just a bunch of hormones and just a bunch of electricity running through a fucking brain, this has really reminded me about uh, just how little in control we are over everything, because this, the only thing it does is slightly alter my uh, chemistry mm-hmm. and my behavior just adjusts to it immediately. Huh. And yeah, yeah. I'm both happy that uh, I'm not bombarding my lungs anymore with things, but also experiencing midlife crisis because I figured <laughs> out- Because you're just a fleshy uh, little automaton. <laughs> exactly. Like if it was, if I was doing SIGs only because uh, it was the chemical reaction, then- what if I like pretty much everything yeah. just because of a chemical reaction, you know? It can be taken to extremes and uh, like the biggest extreme, like we're already starting off heavy. Like you <laughs> yeah. obviously love your daughter because she's your fucking daughter, right? And she's a lovely little human being, etc., etc. But what if we removed that part of our hormones or chemistry mm. or whatever that, is, that necessitates caring for your own child would like your quote unquote soul or whatever still mm. care for it. And that is a terrifying pathway to yeah. go in. Like, like I don't know. That's why I just vibe, bro. The older I get, the more I'm like, yeah, the grill pill, that kind of seems, that kind of seems nice. Yeah. Because when you when you get into the, the biology stuff, it's like, well, why do kids have eyes that are so big? Well, because it makes them look cute and that forms an attachment. You know, like, oh God, so they really, oh God. this biology thing's really trying to get you to care for this kid. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a little, uh, it's a little weird to think about just how much control we actually have, which is why I just don't think about it, and I think that's the best way to live. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. No, like he's on to something, right? Just mm. uh, be fucking stupid, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm calling my co-host a dumb dumb, but yeah. uh, no, which he very much so isn't. But it's, you know, no, I absolutely it, it, am. Some truth but it's to by it. choice. It's by choice. If you if you willingly if you if you take the dumb pill, it's not the blue pill. It's the dumb pill because we're all red pilled here, right? We all know what's going on. But if you actively choose to be like hey man i'm gonna go and pull some weeds in the front lawn and not think about anything or i'm gonna go lie on the couch and stare at the ceiling for a little bit but not get into like an existential dread i'm just gonna like think about video games that rocks my dude it, it's so much more pleasant than uh, spiraling into thinking well am i just Am I a machine? Am I am I yeah. a, 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 a fifty thousand miles or whatever it is of, of electrical wires and and synapses and neurons? Good thing Hakeem's not here to tell us. Actually, you know what? Yep. He'd have a very stoic look, a way to look at it, because he is both a medical doctor and 
a very devout boy, and that's why I appreciate our boy, among many other reasons. Yeah, yeah. He just listen. He found his own uh, couch to lay on and stay and stare into yeah. into the ceiling. It's just different variations of it. Yeah. Which again, again, now now it goes back to the original conversation of uh, we're just drifting along, and even the things that we consider turning off the brain are just using the brain in a in a different matter. Mm-hmm. matter. <laughs> Yeah. Matter, <laughs> uh, this, uh, like um, what was that uh, that, that that saying? Uh, JT, do you like uh, matter babies? Matter babies? What's matter babies? <laughs> I don't know. What's the matter with you, baby? <laughs> Come on, stupid! I knew what the, where that was going as soon as I started talking. Oh well, Thanks. that's the point. That's the matter. You got any life changing updates? Um. Uh, I'll give you another Volvo update because everybody loves these. Um, I have the <laughs> license plates in hand. They're actually in my backpack right behind me. Um, uh-huh. just get, what about the, the entire car? That's yeah. the, 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 the plates. I texted homie again, and he's like, uh, he's driving it this week, and as long as everything, nothing falls <laughs> off it, I can pick it up on Friday. So I will oh believe that when I actually you know, get there on Friday and he lets me take it, but... That's pretty optimistic. That's the first time he's given me a, hey, it's, you know, come pick it up on this day. So, uh, fingers crossed, I'm holding my breath for the next couple days. And uh, this episode will, actually, I guess this episode will be out for patrons. Exactly then. The day of. Oh, boy. So, you patrons are in for a treat. And that's absolutely terrifying to me because I always say, if you ever get your Volvo, the world will end. Yeah. And as you're getting your <laughs> Volvo, I will be flying towards the United States for a family, my girlfriend's family thing or whatever. Yeah. So the worst place for the world to fucking end in is in a fucking plane, which is yeah. kind of already a limbo. So I'll just, you know, step out of limbo into hell. Actually, yeah, it might be a more decent transition. I guess an airport or a plane is the best way uh, for you to experience the apocalypse because it's just, you know, you're already taking a flight there. Ah! <laughs> in my case, you're going to America. So I'm literally like, I'm either going to wake up in real hell uh, or, or the in like States, the, or the biblical close. hell. <laughs> yeah. oh, come on, I was doing the joke better. The uh, real hell were, or the biblical I'm hell. Sorry. Get it? Because the real hell is the United States. Yeah. Y'all want to hear uh, uh, some dad lore from from old, old man Chapman? I, uh, Fuck Yeah. Because I realize you guys have both told interesting stories about your dad, and I don't think I ever have. And uh, I guess it's because he doesn't really just—he doesn't share much about his earlier life, like before we were all the kids were born, or or I guess shortly after I was born, because he was doing some dangerous stuff uh, that really stressed him and my mom out. But anyway, I was visiting uh, them in South Carolina this last week. And he told some stories that I had never heard before. So let me relay one to you because I thought this was kind of interesting. So this was before I was born and then shortly after I was born he was doing this, which was uh, he was working for the family-owned demolition company. Like one of his uncles had a, like a controlled demo company where you know if something's going to fall down they want to make sure it comes down safely so they go and they plant the dynamite and they cut things up so it dude that's the mob yeah. your dad was in the mob <laughs> yeah no, i mean that's we, the mob that's all that's that's literally what are you in oh in the, in the demolition industry or yeah we oh, were, i own a junkyard that's the mob dude. we were in the rust belt at that point yeah so it was very likely it was the italian mob anyway there were no rules back then no regulations for safety and things like that so it was very sus, uh, very scary stuff. They had people dying fairly frequently. When he was, while he was working there, not a long time, like five of his coworkers died. Um, so not fun. Christ. Yeah, but anyway, a ship hit a a bridge in Tampa, Florida, kind of like what happened in in Baltimore earlier this year. If anyone saw that, a ship hit it. It, it became kind of structurally unsound, and they wanted to bring it down safely because it was going to collapse otherwise. So he had two uncles there who were kind of the the partner owners, and they were supposed to do the job themselves, like the the important part of the job, go actually actually go up underneath the bridge, do the the cutting with the cutting torches and stuff like that. And he was basically a trainee along with like a handful of other laborers there to do the support work. But one uncle freaked out because they were like 300 feet up without safety harnesses, um, mm. and he's just he's like I I can't do it I can't do it. And so the other uncle's like All right, Chris, you're up. We only trust family to do this. You come up here right now. <laughs> and so so all, my dad is like, okay, I, I don't know what I'm doing. But he like he took the, they had like a, uh, what do you call it? Like a thick Carhartt 
jacket on because it was super cold and also protects against the sparks. And then they had life preservers on over that in case they fall, you know, 300 feet to the water below. It was basic, you know, if you fall, you're dead. But for, you know, for, yeah, it, it, for looks, you know, for to make people feel like they're more secure, they had the life preservers. Um, and nowadays, all the fucking hipsters wear <laughs> yeah. Carhartt, and they ain't even fucking climbing high places. They're not even they blowing up off. bridges. Yeah, they ain't really. even blowing up bridges. I'm walking over here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> anyway, I always go to the I'm walking over here. It's, any New Yorker listening to this wants to fucking kill himself every time. <laughs> yep. You never know. If I lived in New York, I'd be saying that all the time. Anyway, um, the only trust family for the important jobs, right? So. They go up, they're under, they're on the supports under the bridge. So, you know, the, 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 like the concrete things that you stand on or the metal capped things, I don't know. But they're under the bridge cutting supports, right? And then each time you'd cut a ribbon of the bridge, the whole thing would like creak and sway a little bit as the structural integrity became more compromised. And they were told to cut a hole in the support they're standing on to kind of stick your leg through for stability. And then you reach above you with your cutting torch to sever the supports. And apparently what happened, because, you know, you're reaching above you and it's sparking and like pieces of metal are, are falling off and stuff. Apparently a piece of burning slag fell into my dad's life preserver and he caught fire like on his back, but it was Jesus behind him. Christ. And so all he remembers was like a, a creeping heat on the back of his neck because he's just, you know, reaching up and working. But luckily one of the laborers saw him on fire and made his way over across these these perilous beams and ripped the life preserver off barehanded, which was very, very lucky. So my dad turns around and he saw everyone was just white as a sheet because, you know, Shit. in that industry, they know if you catch fire up there, you're gone. You're dead. There's nothing you can do, right? You're going you're gonna to either jump to, to put the fire out and probably not survive the fall or you're going to burn to death. And so it was very 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 lucky and this was back before um you know cell phones so they couldn't really uh, he couldn't call my mom beforehand to let him let her know that he was going up to do this he was he, he almost died so he was he was shook to say the least and uh after he got back from from that job my mother was like if you ever go up on that again i will kill you myself <laughs> but yeah that's that's Ugh. some that's some dad lore from from old man crazy. chapman he's got some he's got some other crazy stories that he told me i'll save him for another time but like he worked in the arctic circle on on experimental what? oil rigs and stuff and i was like jesus what? dad why didn't you ever tell me this stuff and so he was like i don't know but uh <laughs> he's just that dude that yeah. is the most fucking old school dad ever I yeah mean, uh, it's uh, for, yeah. sorry it's for goddamn pussy used to fucking <laughs> talk about all the good shit they've done yeah um, it's it's like you, you guys were saying last time when you told your dad lore it's like why are our dads why do they have such interesting lives compared to us or like my job is computer <laughs> like I, I sit and do computer <laughs> Oh, such is uh, life. Such is life. Maybe we'll have life. lore one day. To us having lore one day. Even though I kind of do a lot, but... Uh, the, uh, but uh, <laughs> you can't tell about it. I, 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 no, no, compared to, uh, you know, compared to your dad trying to provide for his family, I just throw myself in harm's danger for no fucking reason whatsoever. <laughs> so it's a bit different. It's not that much of a flex. It's just um, a uh, continued protracted path towards uh, slow burning suicide. Welcome back, everyone, to yet another episode of The Deep Program. After a small hiatus, we are back and more dedicated to our work than ever. Today, <laughs> we have something special in store for you. A swim through the rotten lakes of reactionary fervor. A deep dive into some of our favorite, or, I don't know, should I say least favorite, mm. far-right militant organizations. These fail sons vary greatly, but want the same thing at the end of the day. The creation of further hyper high hierarchies, the preservation of the status quo, or the introduction of its even deadlier, more violent version. So strap in as we take a ride through some of the worst filth our species has to offer. <laughs> Men of flesh and blood, just like you and me, who've dedicated their life to the basest, simplest, most backwards aspects of the human psyche, the fascist, the racist, the failson. Welcome to hell. <laughs> 
And just so all the viewers know um, that we're just not talking out of our asses here, we, Ugopnik and I, actually joined all of these organizations. All of these. <laughs> so all you of know these. this is coming from experience. And uh, I don't know about Ugopnik. I'm going to stay in some of them. They seem like pretty cool people. So uh, I don't know. Very chill. <laughs> Very chill. Oh, great food. Great food. I <laughs> Finally, finally, I am not shitting like a fucking fountain every time I go to the toilet <laughs> because it's all so bland. It's like doing miracles for my digestive tract okay <laughs> the only thing I, I have a problem with is you know we talk shit about leftist organizations and their fucking horrible names these guys mm. all have almost the same fucking name except a few uh, a few instances yeah. so i'm like oh am i am i due today at this uh uh white nation reprisal or am i due <laughs> for white identity reprisal and i keep going to the wrong fucking building and it's empty because it's all it's the same 25 guys that went to the <laughs> other organization Rip. But okay, JT, take us on a path with the first proud American organization we want to talk about. You got it, bucko. So uh, I don't know if, if any of you, you dear piggies, have, have watched a, a fairly recent video I did on the subject. I did a kind of a rundown of, of currently existing, or actually existing fascist groups uh, in the United States and, and Canada to an extent. That it's funny, they kind of tend to have the same orgs or sister orgs, which is kind of weird. But one of them... Because Canada is U.S. with healthcare, but yeah. Exactly, yeah. They, you, you think of them being real friendly and stuff, but they're, eh, they got some they got some sus things too, um, probably because of their proximity to us. Sorry, Canada. Um, <laughs> but back this Easter, uh, I if you haven't seen the video, I went to our neighborhood's playground, as we always do, um, with Evie, and there were a bunch of adults picking up like those little plastic Easter eggs, you know, that you can put candy in and stuff. They were picking those up and throwing them in the trash. I was like, that seems weird. Normally it's the kids picking up the Easter eggs and opening them because there's candy inside. So I asked one of the, the adults, like, hey, what's what's going on? Why are you guys throwing these eggs away? And they were just like, take a look inside, but don't let your kids see. I was like, okay. So I, I grab one of the eggs, open it up, and there's this little slip of paper with a dude... Uh, dressed in like an American flag mask thing, the stupid black hat, the the black big black sunglasses, and it said in big bold letters, "Imagine a world without," and then the N word. I was like, Jesus Christ! And and they had the the Patriot Front uh, website or a URL on there, and so that those were just there were dozens of those all over this playground, designed, you know, a place for children to come and play and be kids. It's a wholesome place. I'm like, my God. So that prompted me to make a video about the state of fascist organizations in the United States. And it is one of the things that we'll see throughout these um, different orgs is that they do target specifically the suburbs, the exurbs, the places where young men are most bitter, where they have the least amount of autonomy, the fewest... Um, opportunities for real engagement with with actual real life uh, because the suburbs are, are kind of depressing places so it makes sense but anyway patriot front was the was the group responsible for the easter egg propaganda so let's take a little bit of a look at them they are the youngest operation worth mentioning i would say that currently exists in the u.s they were founded in 2017 after they split off from the neo-nazi group vanguard america following the Unite the Right rally uh, in 2017. Uh, their MO is to combine fascist imagery and rhetoric with the traditional Americana aesthetic, uh, which really resonates with a lot of Americans. All you really have to do is like post that picture of the smiling 50s family grilling out back with their boat and their happy kid and their dog and stuff, and people are like, hell yeah, I will support whatever this picture is attached to. <laughs> um, and so they slip like, you know, a fascies on there or some white replacement myth stuff on there. Uh, they're quite good at it. Like, I'm, I'm playing it down, but if you've ever seen Patriot Front stuff, they're good at what they do. Their presentation is slick. They're definitely the propaganda. that's all they have, man. Literally, yeah, that's it. That's it. Fascist all... only has aesthetics. Because, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, an empty ideology, but if they can dress it up nicely, if they can push the right buttons, it can be very effective. Um, and they're absolutely... So I, I like the, to call it IRL, IRL, D&D, &D, but with <laughs> real people dying. Yeah, yeah, they're LARPing, yeah. <laughs> Which is, it's scary, and we'll get to this later, but it's like, these are, yeah, like, yeah, they're losers, you know, take their masks off and they're just greasy basement dwellers, but they're greasy basement dwellers with guns and real hate. You're like, okay, so yeah, yeah, you know, yeah it's that it's that line from uh, 
uh, Lord of War. You know, a bullet from a 14-year-old is just as effective as a bullet from a 40-year-old. So he's like, yeah, if you get enough angry kids, that's not good. Anyway, they've got a, a real slick operation. They've got a clean website. It's very well presented. The interesting thing is there are only about 200 of them if online reports are to be believed. And so they punch well above their weight. Uh, according to the ADL, they were behind 81% of reported incidents in 2021 that involved the distribution of racist, anti-Semitic, and other hateful propaganda in the U.S. Uh, comprising That's a th- dedicated, dedicated no kidding. group, bro. Yeah, they, they, they're you know prolific. They That was 3,992 incidents, and that was every single continental state in the U.S. It was, so no, no Hawaii, no Alaska, but all 48 continental states, they had a hand in distributing this kind of this rhetoric, this hate speech. The Patriot Front is is currently led by a guy called Thomas Ryan Russo, who was a teenager when he started the Splinter Group. Uh, he had taken control of Vanguard America's Discord server and website, <laughs> uh, which is it's so funny. It's like this this stu- this is stuff that will be studied a hundred years in the future. Where you know we're like okay they they did a coup of of the the printing press or whatever back in in, in Lenin's day but okay they, he took the the Discord he took the <laughs> the keys of to course, yeah. to, to Fash Den Leet three sixty whatever uh, <laughs> and their website but and this was after the or shortly before the the twenty seventeen rally then after the bad press that Vanguard got after Unite the Right he took the domain and built the Patriot Front website as it currently exists, and he began recruiting members, most of whom were from Vanguard. So it was a little bit of a coup, a little bit of a rebrand, but it, it was just kind of rolling the same rhetoric into a new a new package. And let me let me read one brilliant passage from their manifesto. Quote Membership within the American nation is inherited through blood, not ink. <laughs> e- even those born in America may yet be foreign. Nationhood cannot be bestowed upon those who are not of the founding stock of our people, and those who do not share the common spirit that permeates our greater civilization and the European diaspora. In order to survive as a culture, a heritage, and a way of being, our nation must learn that its collective interests are fighting against its collective threats of replacement and enslavement. The damage done to this nation and its people will not be fixed if every issue requires the approval and blessing from the dysfunctional American democratic system. Democracy has failed in this once great nation. So TLDR, they want a fash daddy, and they think the, the coloreds are icky. They're, icky, brother. It's, it's so funny when you read this stuff. It's like, you know. But it's good. No, but it's, yeah. it's decent. Like it addresses yeah. that they are European diaspora, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it addresses that this land has been taken. Yes. But they say, we took it and fuck you. Exactly. We get to keep it. Exactly. And now they're taking it for us and we're going to take it back. So I'll give them I'll give them 7 out of 10 racism because it's like honest 7 out of 10 racism. Right. They're not just pretending that they were always native or whatever, which a lot of fascist American yeah. groups somehow managed to Very goofy. Do. Very goofy. But yeah, and by doing that, they get around this common comeback. It's like, oh, you're not native here. You're, you're from Ireland. Your family's from Ireland or Germany or wherever. But they're like, yeah, we took this country. What of it? We're not native, but we took this. It is ours by conquest. And they actually have stickers that say, not stolen, conquered. And so it's they're very much playing onto that, you know, that's warrior strong. spirit thing. Yeah, I can see that clicking. Yeah, that's very strong. Absolutely. And it's interesting that they still have so few people, if indeed that is the an accurate number. They may just be stealthy about it. But yeah, they. if I had to put money on it, I would say they're the, they will be the most influential of the fascist groups if they continue to exist, if they're not a Fed front, you know, all the, the common asterisks that people bring up because they've got a really slick operation, their messaging is, is effective, and they've got good reach, even if they're they're quite small. So that's that's Patriot Front for you. You've probably seen their their handiwork in your state if you live in the U.S. But Yugovnik, tell us about a non-U.S. group. Okay, so let me take you across the pond or back across the pond as uh, Eurocentrists like the ones you mentioned <laughs> would say and talk about some actually white supremacists, <laughs> not like these Amerimuts as the very whites from Europe like to refer to their American white counterparts. Filthy uh, mixed breeds. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I love racist infighting. It, yeah. my, like I genuinely live for it. Anyways, let us travel to Europe, the land of art, music, food, and 
well a lot of a lot of fucking hatred okay <laughs> we start off with a group calling themselves generation identity not to be confused with identity of Europa or identity uh, Europe or <laughs> the American European identity group uh, yeah they'll really like the word identity yeah. well which you know is just uh, a not necessary dog whistle more like yeah. a whale whistle for white <laughs> uh, but yes generation identity is a pan-european youth movement that began in France in 2012 as the youth wing of les identitaires uh, which is again French for identity like <laughs> Jesus I'm That's feeling bad thing. about our names yeah. more and more less bad about our names more and more um, it has expanded to the UK Ireland Germany Austria and Flanders GI argues that white Europeans are being replaced by non-European migrants, a concept they call, as we all know, the Great Replacement. Mm. And they aim to stop what they see as the Islamization of Europe, globalization, and this specific demographic change. GI's goals are to preserve European ethno-cultural identity, as they say, defend freedom of speech against far-left attackers, another eternal classic, repatriate illegal immigrants, promote and this one's interesting promote african development to reduce mm. emigration and secure national borders this continues the separation of races idea they say underpins their whole that's ideology. Uh, that's yeah. interesting that's like big brain fascist stuff like that's not just like we hate black people we want to send them away they are devoted they're so devoted to their their separation that they will give money to the black people they want to keep in Africa. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and they, w they will even like uh, go so far as to like openly talk to Arabs or black people, et cetera, et cetera, and tell them, no, we want you to prosper in your own fucking place, okay? Yeah. We want this place for us. We want all the best for you over there, which is uh, high-end manipulation because yeah. we know capitalism cannot survive without imperialism. So eventually they'll yeah. come uh, immigrate uh, and replace uh, over <laughs> where the evil browns but it gives have been them a, deported to. It gives them a semblance of legitimacy, though. They're like, oh, yes. We're, yeah, we're not hateful. We're just, you know, you know, separate but equal, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. It, it works. It works really well, just like the honesty of Patriot Front. That previous yeah. topic, this, this, uh, this uh, seemingly small change does give them mm -hmm. uh, legitimacy in the eyes of uh, yet-to-be-radicalized normies to mm -hmm. an extent, because... For 99% of people at this point, being a Nazi is just too much. Yeah. So, in summer of 2017, identitarian leaders from Europe launched what they aptly titled Defend Europe to huh. obstruct NGOs rescuing refugees in the Mediterranean. They raised over 200K, mainly from American far-right activists, uh. to rent a ship. What happened next was legendary. Canadian alt-right blogger now cucked, oh, I don't want to be a trad wife anymore, Lauren <laughs> Southern joined, by the way, that's the update to her lore, if anybody's interested, <laughs> uh, joined three members of Generation Identity in an attempt to disrupt a Doctors Without Borders ship's rescue mission off the coast of Libya. Yes, that we're talking about that level of evil, right? Right. Nearly 1,000 undocumented immigrants from Sub-Saharan Africa attempted to cross the Central Mediterranean Sea daily back then, often in perilous conditions, with more than 55,000 having made the journey that year by mid-May, though at least 2,300 had drowned, including many children. On the night of May 12th, Southern and the GI members staked out the Doctors Without Borders ship in Catania, Italy. As the ship departed, they live-streamed their actions, attempting to block its path with a raft, unfurling <laughs> a banner and screaming, no way for human trafficking. Very uh, uh. cheeky. Despite their efforts, they were quickly taken into custody <laughs> by the Italian Coast Guard, allowing the ship to continue its mission. This incident marked the beginning of a broader initiative by Generation Identity. The following week, GI launched a crowdfunding campaign for Defend Europe, a mission to patrol the Mediterranean, intercept the immigrant boats, and hand over immigrants to the Libyan Coast Guard. Yes, the Libyan Coast Guard, because wow. the, yeah, otherwise they would go into <laughs> Europe. They plan to sink the empty boats as well 
promoted by alt-right figures like David Duke, Richard Spencer, and Jared Taylor, Defend Europe quickly raised the previously mentioned 200K, significantly wow. exceeding its initial goal. They chartered a ship, the Sea Star, and set out to disrupt NGO operations. The failed sun experiment begins. Let me quote from the Southern Poverty Law Center article. <clears throat> Defend Europe had trouble even getting its ship to the central Mediterranean. <laughs> First, it was delayed for a full week by their inability to produce routine crew paperwork needed to cross the Suez Canal. Then came a disastrous July 27th refueling stop in Farmagusta, a city on the east coast of Cyprus. Port inspectors there found 20 Sri Lankan men on board whose, cr cr whose crew member identification appeared counterfeit. <laughs> the inspectors said the men admitted they were not professional seamen. According to The Guardian, the Sri Lankans told local human rights activists they had paid the equivalent of almost $12,000 each to be smuggled to Italy what? aboard the Defend <laughs> no. Europe ship. Yes, what? these are the most principled white supremacists of all time. We're <laughs> definitely not using the shit you pay us to stop immigrants to make some money off of, well, immigrants. No, not at all. Anyways, even though <laughs> they likely could have told them we'll take you to Italy and then dump them in, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in Libya or something similar, but you get my points. Anyways, continuing. Police arrested the ship's owner, captain, senior of, uh, officers, and Defend Europe activist, Shalier, on charges related to human trafficking. After making a court appearance a few days later, they were released for lack of evidence. Defend Europe claimed the Sri Lankan men were apprentice sailors <laughs> rather than uh, full-fledged crew members and denied any knowledge of falsified documents or human trafficking. 15 of the 20 crew members were deported to Sri Lanka. After leaving Famagusta uh, on August 1st, the Sea Star meandered off the coast of Libya for a week. During that time, Defend Europe posted a photo of Seller yelling at an NGO ship through a megaphone. Then it posted a recording of Selner harassing the captain of a Doctors Without Borders vessel on ship-to-ship -ship radio, quote, We will start our operation in front of the Libyan coast. We advise you to leave the search and rescue area because you're acting as a pool factor for human traffickers making them billions. We will watch you. The days of your unwatched <laughs> garbled sound are over. To which uh, the, the captain sighed and said, um, thank you for your information. <laughs> <laughs> and turned off the radio. On August 7th, Defend Europe tried to refuel at Zarzis, Tunisia, but was thwarted by local fishermen who blocked the refueling channel with small <laughs> boats waving signs that read, No Racists. Nice. Four days later, the captain of the Sea Star issued an emergency distress call due to, quote, <laughs> machinery damage failure. He reported the Defend Europe boat was dead in the water. The Maritime Rescue Coordination Center in Rome dispatched the nearest ship to rescue the crew of the Sea Star. That ship was the CI, an NGO vessel that Defend Europe was following. <laughs> I am not kidding. The racists were about to be saved by a refugee ship. Huh. I wish I was making this up. That's As it great. approached, however, here they were principled, I guess, the Sea Star captain retracted the distress call. And Defend Europe soon posted online that minor te technical difficulties caused the unnecessary SOS. Satellite tracking, though, showed the Sea Star was idle for the next 42 hours. <laughs> this is how the Great White Project pretty much came to an end. Broken down in the water after potentially having tried to smuggle Sri Lankans and with their greatest success being screaming over a megaphone in the middle of the sea. Hmm. But as we all know, people tend to be, well, fucking stupid and despite these setbacks and failure to intercept any immigrant boats, GI declared the mission a success, using the publicity to boost their profile. The mission garnered significant media attention, elevating Martin Selner, uh, GI 
guy's Austrian leader and the movement itself. Selner used this newfound fame to expand GI's presence, establishing new chapters in several countries and gaining a substantial social media following. GI's UK branch officially launched in 2017 with a banner drop on Westminster Bridge reading Defend London, Stop Islamization. This event then marked the culmination of a significant promotional campaign by Selner, who had been touring Europe and America to drum up support. The UK branch was seen as a strategic hub for the movement with a well-developed website and content translated into English, targeting a broader audience. Despite internal challenges such as leadership disputes and infiltration by anti-fascist groups, GI continued to use the perceived success of Defend Europe to fundraise and expand. Selner, now a prominent figure in the far-right movement, dismissed accusations of extremism, framing GI's <laughs> mission as a defense of traditional European cultural identity. The Defend Europe mission, though a complete meme, succeeded in significantly raising the profile of generation identity, helping them expand and solidify their presence across Europe and beyond. Online, though, well, they've been banned pretty much everywhere. And in 21, U.S. Representative Elisa Slotkin called the U.S. government to designate more than a dozen foreign white supremacist groups as terrorist organizations, including GI. At least we can do some things right sometimes. <laughs> Not only the commies getting labeled uh, terrorist groups, hooray. Honestly, like I know it's undermining, and you know they managed to pull a quick one with uh, with a massive failure turning into a okay-ish yeah. success. <laughs> but uh, I think it will be worth it to let them operate because they they're just doing our work for us. Like yeah. these men are like the definition of the fail son, and uh, they're a great kind of uh, piggy to point at and say, "Ha ha, look at them, so funny." A bunch of goobers. Yeah, they just make themselves look bad, and every other fascist by extension. But I will say, to their credit, they actually raised a bunch of money, spent the money, got a ship, and went to try to do stuff. Even if they absolutely failed and sucked at it and were really funny to laugh at, they did organize something. So, you know, that's yeah. that's something to... Be aware of, thing. I guess. Yeah, they did the thing. The thing. Now all they need they is, is uh, some competent leadership. Can you imagine a fleet of ships one day? <laughs> great, that's all we need. Yeah, no, it's going to be great because the ships are just going to crash into each other. Yeah, a fleet of dinghies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, uh, let's move back to the United States, the best goddamn place on earth. Uh, we're going to talk about the Proud Boys a little bit now. Uh, you've probably heard about the Proud Boys. They they might be the most uh, well-known of the fascist groups in the U.S. They are... I'm a pretty proud boy myself. <laughs> you talking? know, the name actually comes from a song that was cut from the 1992 animated Aladdin film, but then was used wow. in like a 2011 uh, stage production or something like that, and Gavin McInnes, who's one of the founders, really loved it. He thought it was... He said it was the dumbest song in the world, but he couldn't get enough of it. Anyway, I'll get to that in a sec. So they're an exclusively male fascist group in the U.S. and Canada. I, I love that they have an explicit no girls allowed <laughs> condition for their club. They're so soft. Um, there is a women's spinoff group, but it's not called the Proud Girls. It's called the Proud Boys' Girls. It has, there has to be the ownership <laughs> thing there, which is so cringe. I, I, uh, I, they had Proud Wives right there. Like, yeah. The proud Wives, like right there. Uh, it's so stupid. Uh, they're such losers. Anyway, this was established in 2016 by Gavin McInnes, who was one of the co-founders of Vice. And McInnes said at one point that victim mentality is rampant among women and minorities, that it's unhealthy and that, quote, there's an incentive to be the victim. And then he also goes on to say that white men and white culture are under siege and literally said criticism of his ideas are victim blaming. So it's <laughs> like, you people, this, you know, it's, to anyone who, who's paying attention, it's very obvious what they're doing. Like, they, they're incredibly hypocritical. They're claiming that they're oppressed while, you know, all that stuff. But it's just so funny to see it back to back like that. They're, they're big proponents of the white genocide myth, the great replacement, whatever you want to call it. Um, they've been described as an alt-right fight club, conservative extremists, alt-light, 
overtly Islamophobic and misogynistic, hipster racists, and all too willing to embrace racists, anti-Semites, and bigots of all kinds. Personally, my favorite there is hipster racists, which is very funny. They do often... Legendary. They, they try to look so cool, and God, they're so cringe. Anyway, they had a big presence at January 6th. They have engaged in political violence, and they've been banned from pretty much every social media platform, which is good, right? We're not going to say that that banning these people is bad. We, we we like when fascists get banned. We acknowledge that we also get banned, right? So. Yeah, yeah, but it's great until they say, okay, we're removing all extremists from yes, platforms. That yeah. includes communists. We do not want to see seem biased or uh, exemplify you know, what's the American term? Partisanship, uh -huh, yeah. yeah. So we we're banning be, yeah, everything except Reddit everything. and the Chive or whatever it's called. <laughs> All right. Uh, their most recent leader, as far as we know, was Enrique Tario, a Miami Cuban and one of the fabled brown white supremacists. He got 22 years in prison for his role in January 6th, and he won. Isn't, isn't like, it crazy yeah. how the, the, the sorry for interrupting you, no, again, no, no. but isn't it crazy how the out of a white supremacist group they found a brown guy and they gave him 22 years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah. I was like, all right, wait, 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 wait. Ah, here's one. <laughs> Give him two decades. Yeah, but he whined like a baby at the sentencing. He said uh, something like, Your Honor, please, I beg you, do not take my 40s from me. It's like, come on, man. That's how quick the tough guy act crumbles. Hilariously, he was also an informant for the feds, which was revealed at his trial, and it just shattered the Proud Boys illusion of their invincibility and their, you know, their excellent security apparatus or whatever and they're super paranoid now you've got some um local branches they're like we're not going to listen to the national branch until there's a, a this kind of election or whatever and then they're not talking to each other so it's it's very fragmented maybe they'll collapse that would be cool uh, but they're super paranoid now uh now their hazing and initiation process is amazing it's it's so funny there are four <laughs> phases the first phase is a loyalty oath which goes I am a proud Western chauvinist. I refuse to apologize for creating the modern world. The second is getting punched until the person recites pop culture trivia, such as the names of five <laughs> breakfast cereals. <laughs> which is just so okay, stupid. that's kind of fun. I would it do is, that. It's, yeah, it's like your generic frat boy stuff, right? Yeah, I would do that. Yeah. The third is getting a tattoo and agreeing not to masturbate. Those two go together. <laughs> okay, not I'm not doing that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And the fourth is getting into a major fight, quote, for the cause. Now, they later amended the straight jork in it policy to read, <laughs> no heterosexual brother of the fraternity shall masturbate more than one time in any calendar month. Okay, very specific. <laughs> and also banned cargo shorts and crystal meth, presumably because they had problems with both. I don't know. That's so funny. That's so specific. Oh, my God. I love it. So, like... Reading about these people, like, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, ban cargo shorts, ban crystal meth. <laughs> Coke, regular powder cocaine is fine, apparently, which is very funny. Yeah. And, and, you know. uh, and bo boss don't wear shorts, bro. Boss don't yeah. wear shorts. <laughs> That's so uh, Don don't wear shorts. No, it was don don't wear shorts. Yeah, don don't yeah. wear shorts. I get, but, you know, again, it's easy to dunk on these losers. Also important to remember they're dangerous, blah, blah, blah. They call for violence against perceived enemies. They're often seen wearing six MWE shirts. If you've seen this before but not sure what it is, Six MWE means uh, six million wasn't enough. If you're, you know, that's, Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know what they're referring to there. Um, very anti-Semitic group, uh, and they literally can't be initiated until they've gotten in a physical fight for their shitty cause. So you know, ridicule your enemy, but don't underestimate them. Humiliation is a is a good tactic to to disabuse people of the notion they're doing something cool. But also, if they're carrying guns. You know, be aware that guns are dangerous and they could shoot you. So there you go. Just another PSA. But that's that's the Proud Boys. They've been classified as a terrorist group in Canada. Canada's classified just about all of these as terrorist groups, actually, which, you know, good for them. And a lot of them have caved in Canada and a couple in the United States. But yeah, that's the Proud Boys. So take us on another journey across the pond. Thank you very, very much, sir. Uh, not very proud. I would not be very proud if I was a part of them boys. Sorry, <laughs> I, I really needed to say that sentence. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, let's stay over on that side of the pond Ooh. for now and talk about some straight freaks that only the U.S. can honestly create. Okay? <laughs> nice. I'm talking complete lunacy. I'm talking bath salts 
the ideology. <laughs> I'm talking shit that would make even the most disgruntled conspiracy nut of an uncle retreat in cringe. Wow. I'm talking Atom Waffen. Oh, God. <laughs> now, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know them, yeah. yeah. Now, Atom Waffen Division is a neo Nazi terrorist organization that emerged from Iron March, an influential fascist online forum that went offline in 2017. AWD operates through, I'm saying AWD, I'm not saying Atom Waffen, okay? Yeah. <laughs> AWD operates through a network of terror cells with the aim of accelerating civilizational collapse to establish a dystopian and apocalyptic vision of <laughs> nationalist socialism. I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking of all the car guys in the audience and car gals in the audience thinking, okay, AWD, all-wheel drive we'll operates drive. through a network of terror cells yeah. with the aim of accelerating collapse. <laughs> 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 Front-wheel drive oh. supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> For, yeah, Continue. Exactly. Continue. Oh, legendary. Now, the group is d uh, deeply influenced by figures like James Mason, Charles Manson, uh, jo uh, Giuseppe Tomasi, and William Pierce, and draws strategic inspiration from the Order, a violent white supremacist cell active in the 80s. AWD adheres to a doctrine of white power accelerationism, which posits that modern society is irredeemably degenerate and corrupt. Accelerationists believe that the only way to establish a white ethnostate or utopia is through the deliberate hastening of societal collapse via violence and terror. Just very wholesome guys. Yeah. Unlike other white power activists who might seek political or mass movement solutions, accelerationists advocate for leaderless resistance and decentralized cell-structured networks to carry out terror attacks. AWD engages in various activities to promote its ideology and prepare for what they see as an inevitable societal collapse. These activities include fun stuff like hate camps. <laughs> AWD organizes training meetups where members practice. You can play like the, the corporate music in the background <laughs> yeah. if you want to. Yeah. Hate camps. AWD organizes training meetups where members practice with weapons, produce propaganda videos, and indoctrinate new recruits. These camps are a crucial part of their strategy to build a cadre, a cadre of violent a cadre. And a cadre, sacamadadre, <laughs> a cadre of violent and ideologically committed mil militants. Two, online and offline harassment. AWD members have been involved in harassing and threatening private citizens, journalists, and other perceived enemies, both online and in person. This harassment is intended to intimidate and silence opposition. Number three, propaganda. The group produces and disseminates a significant amount of propaganda that glorifies violence, promotes their ideology, and recruits new members. Their propaganda often features apocalyptic imagery and rhetoric that emphasizes the necessity of racial cleansing through violent means. If you do not know, these guys kind of like hyper popularized the red glowing eyes that mm -hmm. even recently Joby Den uh, used in one of his photos on Twitter. Uh, but they really pushed it, and the aesthetic is completely on top with uh, with uh, you know the Nazi zone and the sun in the background mm, with yeah. everything. Like it, uh, it looks really good. Like you know, for like a half a millisecond, I'm like, fuck you, yeah, let's. Oh no, actually, I'm I was a like, nice oh no, that's bank. Nazi wave. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyways. AWD's ideological and strategic framework is heavily influenced by historical and contemporary figures in the white power movement. Key influences include, as we said, James Mason, a neo-Nazi author whose works particularly uh, Ziege uh, advocate for violent, not siege, Ziege, like uh, victory in German, mm -hmm. like... Because I, I thought you were gonna say no, no, siege. no, no, and now you're gonna, and now you're gonna keep that in the <laughs> yep. thing, probably. <laughs> uh, they, it, it advocates for violent revolution and terrorism to achieve white nationalist goals. Mason's writings are foundational to AWD's theory and philosophy. Now we have the, another very wholesome individual called Charles Manson, the infamous cult leader who orchestrated a series of brutal murders in the 1960s. AWD members admire Manson for his apocalyptic visions and revolutionary rhetoric. Hmm. Now we have Joseph Tomasi, founder of the National Socialist Liberation Front, an early advocate of leaderless resistance and militant neo-Nazism, and William Pierce, author of The Turner Diaries. Yeah. Probably a lot of you know them. A novel that depicts a violent overthrow of the U.S. government by white supremacists. The book has inspired numerous acts of terrorism and is considered a blueprint for AWD's activities. Now, 
all-wheel drive strategy <laughs> mirrors that of the order, the white supremacist terror cell led by Robert J. Matthews in the 80s. The order carried out robberies, bombings, and murders to finance and further their goals of a white revolution. AWD members idolize such terrorists, viewing their actions as heroic and necessary steps towards racial purification and the establishment of a nationalist socialist order. Uh, yeah, in the, also in the apocalypse. But then it also doesn't have, like, order, and it's, <laughs> I don't, it's, 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 don't a li- it's a little bit goofy. They're a little bit too into Fallout. They, they just want to blow up things, okay? Yeah. And the, the, they are afraid that somebody might blow up their mom, so they concentrate on just blowing up people that look different than them, okay? <laughs> so, AWD's internal culture is marked by a glorification of violence and a deep disdain for what they perceive as the degenerate modern world. They really hate the world. Mm. The rot- rhetoric is filled with calls for racial violence, hatred towards minorities and LGBTQ. LGBTQ plus individuals and fantasies of a brutal purifying apocalypse. The activities of AWD have drawn significant attention from law enforcement and anti-hate organization. The group's violent rhetoric and actions have made them a priority for both agencies and police forces all over the country. Several AWD members have been arrested and convicted for various crimes, including murder, illegal possession of firearms, and plotting terrorist acts. Despite these setbacks, AWD continues to attract young recruits who are drawn to their radical ideology and the promise of violent revolution. The Iron March Forum, launched in 2011 and active until 2017, became a pivotal online gathering space for young neo-Nazis in general, advocating for violent and extreme ideologies through its slogan in gas the K-word race Jesus. war now 1488 uh, very on the nose and also boots on the ground that one is like eh you could have done without that one no. kind of flows off the mouth a bit better without that one so with over 1,600 users and over 150,000 messages I am fostered a dedicated international network targeting a young audience interested in fascist and white power beliefs there we could find influential figures such as Andrew Orenheimer who praised I am for its strict culture and impactful aesthetics, highlighting its role in spawning numerous fascist organizations in the U.S. and Europe, including National Action and Atomwaffen Division. Following the arrest of key members, Atomwaffen Division shifted towards a more sinister direction under new re- leadership, heavily influenced by James Mason's writing and esoteric Satanist ideologies from groups like Temple of Blood and the <laughs> Order of Nine Angels. So you thought yeah. they were unhinged? Yeah. No, my brothers, sisters, and NBs, we're going deeper. With found under Russell in prison, a Tom Waffen division saw new emerging leaders reshape the group while maintaining Iron March's influence. The group's propaganda grew darker and more varied, and it heightened security and secrecy among members. Despite these efforts, ProPublica's early 2018 investigative report exposed key members, highlighting the group's many, many, many vulnerabilities. The report revealed the failed sons, also known as the Tom Waffen division, expanded to 23 states and had detailed connections to violent acts such as the alleged murder of Blaze Bernstein by IWD member Samuel Woodward. Further reports oh, identify- no. That's going to spawn a stupid conspiracy theory. Woodward and Bernstein, who are the, the, the people who uh, reported on the Watergate scandal. Oh, great. <laughs> Give it 20 years. Mark my words. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. Further reports identified additional AWD members and their involvement in various criminal activities. For example, a guy called Pistolis, an active duty Marine, was linked to AWD and violence at the 2017 Charlottesville rally. Great Gabriel Sohir Chaput, uh, or as we say, Caput, an Iron March moderator, was also exposed, leading to legal actions against him. Arrests of AWD members increased following the Tree of Life synagogue attack in late 2018, reflecting heightened scrutiny from authorities and resulting in a series of convictions and sentences for various crimes. This period marked the beginning of AWD's collapse, exacerbated by internal conflicts, further exposés, and intensified law enforcement efforts. 
The organization was deeply connected to an international neo-Nazi network as well from its inception, evolving from the Iron Marches Forum's global fascist fraternity. AWD's efforts to build this network started early with members like Russell traveling to meet other extremist groups such as National Action in the UK and the Nordic Resistance Movement over in Scandinavia. AWD expanded internationally with cells emerging in Germany and potentially in Ukraine, though the latter's authenticity is doubtful. The Feuerkrieg Division, another <laughs> neo-Nazi group, formed in 2018 and had affiliations with AWD and The Base, a rival yet cooperative group in the US. AWD's internal conflicts included a faction known as Fission, which opposed the group's satanic influences and aimed to dilute AWD's brand. Mm. AWD's collapse accelerated in 2020 due to federal investigations and arrest of key members, including John Cameron Denton and others involved in swatting conspiracies and threats against minorities and journalists. Despite this, AWD's legacy persists, influencing hate-related violence and racially motivated terrorism and invigorating federal law enforcement's focus on white power groups. AWD's founder, Brandon Russell, continued his activities in white supremacist terrorism even after the group's decline. The group's name still evokes fear, evidenced by bomb threats against historically black colleges in 2022. So, I guess these absolute lunatics could potentially have had a much, much greater impact if they had only managed to properly pull off of a larger scale mm -hmm. terrorist attack compared to the things they managed to uh, pull off. Uh, but I guess even they were so unhinged and insane that even this uh, status quo is disgusting as it is found, found it in their uh, right mind to kind of stop them before they grow uh, even further. So I mm -hmm. guess, yeah. Slight W's from time to time. Yeah, a little too much, thankfully, a little too much grimdark fantasy in their free time. A little too much Warhammer 40k has seeped into their their stupid little brains. But, uh, yeah, that is, that's it's scary. Yeah, it goes to show, you know, you don't have to be the well-dressed, soft-spoken fascist that the, the American liberals love to do some damage, as, as <laughs> shown by these freakish shock troopers. Uh, what do you what do you call the German stand the Nazi stands the uh, Werabus uh, the Werabus uh, <laughs> yeah uh, <Verabus>. <laughs> <laughs> stupid all right let's uh let's jump over to the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters I'm bundling these together because they have pretty much the same vibe the same lore <laughs> yes the same lore it's pretty much just a uh, hey we. We love the United States. We're super patriotic. We yeah, love brother. the Constitution, and we right. hate the government, which is very funny to me. <laughs> that, both, that they're anti-government, pro-Constitution. It's like, my guy, that's the founding document. Okay, whatever. Anyway, um, <laughs> there are a lot of 3% bumper stickers in Texas, or at least there were prior to 2021. I haven't seen as many since. Uh, and I don't know so what does what does the three percent stand for? Like the three percent smallest dicks in the U.S. <laughs> or what? what's the <laughs> no? So three percent name is based on the assumption that a country only needs three percent of its population to overthrow the government. Though some ah. people affiliated with the group will offer alternate interpretations because they don't want to be seen as you know advocating for overthrowing the government because that will place them under um, scrutiny. Um, but yeah, that's that is the 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 assumption that they're operating under is the 3% to overthrow a country. Um, Understood. But both of these groups are full of cops and the military, but the Oath Keepers are especially so. Two-thirds of them are former military and cops, and 10% of them are active duty. There are around 5,000 members, but the org claims as many as 38,000, which is quite a lot, which would make them the biggest on, on the list by far, which shouldn't surprise anyone that you know the the violent the cudgel of the state all these cops and stuff are uh, are a bunch of fascists so no surprise there the oath keepers have been more resilient than the other groups not shuttering their operation after january 6th even after a bunch of their members got locked up for 10 plus years on seditious conspiracy charges like a lot of the other groups either folded completely and disbanded or they kind of went underground or they fragmented into a bunch of little local groups and, and shuttered their their national operation but not the oath keepers they're like nah we're good 
they just you know keep on chugging along despite the fact that they've been labeled as a terrorist group uh, again in Canada. I'm not sure if that if they're currently on the list in the United States. But interestingly, as of 2021, 48 state and local officials and 10 sitting state lawmakers were listed among the group's members, which would suggest a different approach from the other fascist cells. They're choosing to pursue electoral infiltration as opposed to strictly acts of terror. And now, historically speaking, terrorism just does not do whatever you're trying to get it to do, unless you're just, you know, a freak who likes creating chaos, you know, right? But if you're trying to accelerate the decline like of society... all-wheel drive, yeah. <laughs> exactly, like all-wheel drive. But in, in places like the United States, which are primed for fascism by default, infiltrating the government, that could prove fruitful, and that may indeed be why they have kept their operation afloat. I don't know. Uh, I don't know that they have that kind of sway. Probably not. But if they are able to maintain enough legitimacy where their people can get elected to state and local um, positions, you know, that bodes well for them or for their strategy in the long run. I don't know if they'll ever get back to the the, the level of prominence that they had prior to the January 6th debacle uh, that has seemed to send a lot of the fascist groups underground for the last few years. Obviously, as the material to conditions deteriorate in the U.S. and around the world, we're going to see a, uh, a sharp uptick in both fascist and socialist uh, rhetoric and uh, hopefully <laughs> class consciousness, we shall see. Um, so you can you can rest assured that their their membership will grow, or they'll spin off into another group like Patriot Front did from Vanguard America or whatever they had. But yeah, that's that's the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters. If you're if you're in Texas, if you're probably Oklahoma as well, these groups are, are fairly common because they appear as like normal guys who like to fish on their bass boats or whatever. They're like the normal <laughs> friggin' uh, slightly overweight dad who who has a couple beers and gets angry political and says, you know, God damn it, this has become a, a tyrannical government and we have the right to overthrow it. <laughs> but you know, that's it's that flavor of fascism where it's just it ju- you know, just skates under the line of where people would say, Hey, you're kind of a Nazi, right? Because they go not for the bombastic, super racist stuff they go more for it is our civic duty to overthrow this decadent regime that caters to blah, 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 bureaucracy and stuff. So they're using a lot of political language and less racially charged stuff, but they're, they're obviously yet another um, race, racist and clearly fascist group. So that's yeah, the Oath Keepers it, and Three Percenters. It, it's less uh, SS leather coats and more uh, beer belly uh, truds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they know the demographic pretty fucking well. That's all I'll give them. <laughs> yeah, they got it on lock. They've got it on lock. You got another one for us? Yes. Maybe we can take another trip back over the pond and then take uh, another little uh, trip over the tiny little pond that separates uh, proper Europe from the guys that don't want to be part of Europe, uh, the good (laughs) old UK. And we can talk about uh, our favorite Anglos, which are, well, the Anglos, uh, the English Defense League, probably the most popular group uh, after the three uh, three percenters here, uh, whose story I will go through pretty quickly, honestly, because uh, it's not that interesting. And I wanted to include a less interesting story just to show you that you know it's not fun to be a fascist because the other two groups obviously sound horrible but one lets you take a vacation in the Mediterranean and the other (laughs) one uh, can be like an edgy like satanist guy who talks about blowing shit up these guys are just well just yeah fucking classic racists so let me give you some prelude in the early 21st century Muslims emerged as Britain's second largest and fastest growing religious group with 2011 census recording 2.7 million Muslims in England and Wales, making up to 4.8% of the population. This demographic shift coincided with Muslims becoming primary targets for far-right groups across the Western world. In Britain in particular, this trend was partly due to diminishing social acceptance of prejudice against Jews and African Caribbean people who had previously been the far-right's main scapegoats. In the later parts of the 20th century, most British Muslims 
Muslims, predominantly of South Asian descent, face racism more for their ethnicity than necessarily their religion. However, by the 21st century, hostility towards them increasingly centered exactly on their Muslim identity, even from other ethnic minorities. The BNP capitalized on the rising anti-Muslim sentiment, launching an explicitly Islamophobic campaign in 2000. This campaign gained the traction following the 9-11 attacks in the US and the 7-7 bombings in London, leading to electoral successes such as a seat on the London Assembly in 2008 and two seats in the European Parliament in 2010. Despite a decline in support by 2011, political scientists noted that uh, the BNP had broadened the scope of the far right in British politics, paving the way for the emergence of the English Defence League. Now, the English Defence League was founded in 2009 amidst a backdrop of increasing tensions in Luton, a town with kind of a significant Muslim population and a history of uh, uh, of Islam of, of uh, more radical Islamist activity. A small, extreme, uh, and kind of unimportant Islamist group's protest against the Royal Anglian Regiment in Luton provoked a strong reaction, leading to the formation of counter-protests. James Yeomans organized a respect our troops protest, but fearing far-right exploitation he cancelled it. Paul Ray, though, an anti-Islamist blogger, then organized an anti-jihadist march under the United People of Luton, which evolved into the EDL after several demonstrations. The group was marked by its connection to the football hooligan scene and efforts <laughs> to unite various far-right groups under a common cause against what they perceived as the Islamization of Britain. Tommy Robinson, whose real name, by the way, is Stephen Haxley London, quickly became the EDL's de facto leader after Ray distanced himself from the group. The guy's, by the way, like maximum 1 meter 20 <laughs> tall, like Jesus Christ. They're literally the tallest racist, right? So, <laughs> Robinson Robinson, a former uh, BNP member with a criminal record, of course, was articulate and kind of media savvy, as all, sh as all short people are, hey. helping to boost <laughs> the EDL's profile. His cousin, Kev Kevin Carroll, and multimillionaire IT consultant Alan Ayling, also a short man, who used <laughs> the pseudonym Alan Lake, <laughs> were also key figures in the organization. Under Robinson's great short leadership, the ed <laughs> EDL staged numerous high-profile, <laughs> high more like short profile <laughs> protests on. and became a significant presence in the far right landscape of Britain. Despite internal conflicts and leadership changes, as we all know, short people do a lot of infighting. So the EDL <laughs> the ED <laughs> This is the you are the best at the short stuff. You just never stop. You latch on yeah. and you yeah, kill yeah, it's so easy. I would make the huh. best biggest ever. No. The EDL's formation and activities exemplify what political scientist Roger Eatwell he eats, a, he eats really well, <laughs> yeah. termed cumulative extremism, where one extremist group's actions spur the formation of others, reflecting the growing complexities of identity and, more importantly, nationalism in contemporary Britain. Following the decline of the British Nationalist Party, the English Defence League, if you're getting confused by all these names, it's normal. You don't really yeah. need to remember them. Nobody, like, nobody gives a fuck. Uh, but yeah, the EDL saw a rise when so Hitler 1 started losing and then Hitler 2 saw a rise in its profile amongst uh, the constituents okay which was almost so, entirely the composition of Hitler 1 it's the same people yeah yeah pretty branded, much yeah. pretty much plus like three dudes yeah. okay so the EDL positioned itself as a response to public dissatisfaction with the government's handling of extremist Muslim preachers and organizations it argued that English culture was being marginalized citing instances like state schools serving only halal meat and discontinuing Christmas nativity plays as well as local authorities not flying the St. George flag. Like they're literally just copying Americans. They're like, yeah. oh my God, they say happy holidays, not happy we Christmas. We have to be aggrieved. Yeah, God. Yeah, and we're not putting enough American flags up indeed. So, Also, what English culture? Like standing neck deep in bogs? <laughs> what do you people do? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, so from 2009 to 2015, they can't even stand in bogs nowadays 
days. They're too short. Okay, so <laughs> from 2019 to 2015, the EDL organized between 10 and 15 demonstrations annually, attracting crowds from 100 people to, wow. impressively, 3,000 people. Okay. Despite facing criticisms from media commentators and anti-fascist groups who labeled them as racist and far-right, the EDL rejected these terms. Of course they did. Mm. Anti-fascist groups like Unite Against Fascism and various Islamic organizations frequently organized counter-protests. The EDL also targeted left-wing groups, as one does when they're not a fascist, mm-hmm. with Robinson threatening student anti-fee protests in December 2010 and harassing Occupy, the anti-capitalist protests, in 2011. During the English riots of 2011, EDL members mobilized in predominantly white areas of outer London, claiming to protect residents from rioters, mm-hmm. leading to clash with police and an incident where EDL members attacked a bus carrying black kids. Jesus. By 2011, the EDL began to lose momentum due to internal divisions, regional rivalries, and personal conflicts among leaders. Several northern divisions started identifying as the infidels, <laughs> distancing themselves from the EDL. Yeah, irony yeah. isn't lost on me <laughs> in that one. Uh, so, uh, this fracturing peaked at a rally in Blackburn, where clashes between Robinson supporters and Jon Snowy, <laughs> Shaw, <laughs> I mean... Uh, uh, faction led to Robinson's assault conviction in 2011. His criminal record prevented him from entering the U.S., and in 2013, he was jailed for using another man's passport to attempt illegal entry. Concurrently, Carroll's bail conditions restricted him from contacting EDL members, further weakening the organization. Their credibility suffered further when links to Anders Behring Breivik, the Norwegian far-right terrorist who killed 77 people Mm. in 2011, were exposed. Breivik, who had connections with the Norwegian Defense League, claimed to have numerous EDL members as Facebook friends and spoke very positively of the group. Robinson and Ray condemned Breivik's actions, but some EDL members still praised him. Following the attacks, police investigated Ray's links to Breivik, while two EDL supporters were convicted of plotting to bomb a mosque in Trent. By early 2013, the EDL was considered in decline, with diminishing attendance at events, Robinson's imprisonment, and its failure to pretty much gain any political traction at that point. Splinter groups like the Northwest Infidels <laughs> and the Southeast Alliance emerged, some adopting more extreme stances and cooperating with the National Front. The rise of UKIP, which capitalized on anti-immigrant sentiment, further diminished the EDL's appeal, leading its leadership to endorse tactical votes voting for UKIP in 2013, even though UKIP quote-unquote distanced themselves from the EDL. Not really. That's Mm. bullshit. So, Mm -hmm. the EDL experienced a brief revival following the murder of soldier Lee Rigby in May of 2013, with membership increasing on social media and several flash demonstrations taking place. However... In twen- uh, by the end of 2013, Robinson and Carroll announced their departure from the EDL after discussions with Killiam Think Tank, which aimed to undermine the group by facilitating their exit. Robinson's departure led to significant anger among supporters, resulting in the establishment of a collective leadership model within the EDL. Uh, they became communists, I guess, but only <laughs> yeah. for themselves. So, this, But anyways... Despite its decline, the issue that fueled the EDL's rise, particularly anti-immigration and anti-Islam sentiment, persisted in many white working-class communities. Other far-right groups like Britain First and Pegida UK emerged adopting similar tactics to the EDL. In 2015, Robinson launched Pegida UK, inspired by the German movement. Pegida lasted a year. (laughs) Another group to the Felsen trash can hey you gotta love these groups they're like i'm so afraid of of other cultures coming bro what are they gonna do to you huh they're gonna give you better food on your cursed island come on (laughs) it's just relax the the the, the people that come might be a bit shorter so you might have taller grandkids (laughs) which will completely ruin your identity with yourself Uh, that's why yeah there it is you never drop it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I will not. I will not. The well, only okay. accepted form of body shaming slash discrimination based on uh, uh, external aesthetics is heightism, okay? Uh, he show can me, do it. It's, me, okay. it's okay, dear listener. You can me, do it. He's got a short friend. <laughs> show me, yeah, I, exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to say. But also show me a good short person, okay? 
wait. No, no. Tell me, tell me. Short, uh, good historical figure who was short. I'll Danny wait. DeVito. Yeah, yeah. You got nothing for that, do you? He's still alive. He's still alive. He might. He's not historical. Horrible. He doesn't count. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in that case, yeah, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. But as soon as Danny DeVito dies, oh, brother, your argument is in the dumpster. Uh, anybody in the <laughs> comments, give me give me an argument for, for a good short person or come uh, come on Twitch chat and fucking write it there. I, I'll wait. It's probably going to take you a year. You will, never, you will never find one, okay? Let's wrap this up. I'll give you just a, a little bit of, of, of ranting here, and we'll, and we'll call it a day. The type of racist xenophobia exhibited by all of these groups it's not new right every fascist project in history has needed to create a chosen people and a barbaric enemy to justify their anti-human politics even a, a cursory glance at any history book will make it clear where this trend comes from but why does it start in the first place human beings can be can we, we can be awful distrustful people but but just randomly deciding to build an exterminatory worldview out of our bigotry doesn't make much sense, right? We need, to, we need to look beyond the culture war rhetoric to really understand the appeal of fascism. Socialism and fascism are both on the rise. And, you know, for us, for people listening, for people paying attention, it's pretty easy to see why, right? Beneath every movement is an economic catalyst. Fascism is seen as a solution to an economic problem, just as socialism is. But the difference is that fascism does not threaten the primacy of capital or the comfortable position of the white liberal, a critical ally of fascist movements throughout history. Economic hardship creates conditions where bitterness, distrust, and desperation can thrive, making the masses an easy target for charismatic and bombastic fascists. The problem is the solution the fascists land on is to exterminate or deport anyone deemed to be detrimental to white people making money, or keeping their privileged position, or, in their eyes, prevent hardworking patriots from losing economic ground because their opportunities are being stolen by foreigners. The economic base of fascism has always been the petite bourgeois, or as I like to call them, the roofing class, the, the small business owners, the guys who have a handful of contractors and pay 1200 bucks a month on an F-150 Raptor they use to pick up groceries and never take off-roading. I, I really do try my best to understand fascists because it's an interesting phenomenon, and I'm sure you do the same, Hugo. Uh, socialism offers, in my opinion, a common-sense solution to the ills of capitalism. It's, it's economic democracy. The people who do the work have a say in how the work is done, and profits can't be siphoned off by unelected corporate tyrants. Fascism, on the other hand, has to create this elaborate fantasy to justify why one particular group of people is destined to inherit the earth. And conveniently, it's the people in your country and the group that you happen to fall into, right? So if I try really hard to check my basic human decency at the door, I can see why fascist mythology is appealing, right? It lets you off the hook. It justifies the worst cruelties because you are defending what is good and righteous from human animals, to use Gallant's phrase. These people who want to tear down a beautiful civilization. The problem, though, is the civilization fascists claim to be defending has never existed. It's a myth. There is no single white race. Just ask the Irish, or the Italians, or the Russians, or the Ukrainians, or the Jews, who have all had their white card revoked or granted at some point. There is no period in American history, to use you know my own homeland, there's no period here where everything was great for the white working class. Every worker in this country has always been at the mercy of the elite. But not the elite fascists assume are pulling the strings. It's not some shadowy cabal of woke Jews, right? It's just the people who own the means of production. And they're not shy about it. People like Warren Buffett routinely admit there's a class war being raged, and the capitalists just want to make sure that they win it. They're very class conscious. This glorious fascist revolution these self-proclaimed patriots want, it's not revolutionary at all. It's just turning back the clock to a time where these class antagonisms were less apparent, where the capitalist class still had complete control over society, but maybe black people had fewer rights. Ooh, yay. If that's your vision of a utopia... You are a moron. Fascism is a morally bankrupt and intellectually dishonest ideology for teeny tiny baby brains. And it also happens to be the biggest threat to socialism and genuine progress. So for, for the, I think the third time this episode, know your enemy, 
but also know what they're capable of and organize to crush them. Beautifully put. And as JT was uh, being so eloquent, soldiers surrounded the Bolivian presidential palace in an attempted coup. Another one in, what, five years. Yeah. So, yeah. They are not strong. They are weak. They are funny, funny fail sons until they start storming your fucking capital buildings. Mm. Uh, and as JT says, know your fucking enemy.